ado, uh, let oh yeah, right, Zoom's got that funny thing now. Uh, without further ado, let's let's dive into the, this evening's topic. So I'm really hoping that uh, tonight's session really brings through uh, this thing full circle for those of you that have been following us for a while right now. Uh, and I hope that you get to the point where you can start to envision yourself being able to actually make hunting uh, a realistic part of your lifestyle, you know, and, and feel the empowerment of going out on the land, being able to bring home food for your family, and just as importantly, having the confidence to know that you're doing it in a way that's sustainable and ethical. Uh, that's absolutely essential to me and, and the values that I stand behind. And I know Caleb and uh, Daniel come from the same place there. Um, that, you know, if we're going to hunt, we need to be stewards of the earth and we need to make sure we're doing it in right relation um, and in a way that allows this to happen for generations to come. So I'm going to just create a little bit of context about why I'm so stoked for this call tonight and this series in general. And I guess I can say it by saying I was super hesitant to run this series, uh, this free one and kind of spread it far and wide out in the world, as well as run the course that Caleb and I are running right, right now that we're calling the, the Hunter's Journey. And there's kind of two main reasons why I was so hesitant to want to put something about hunting out in the world. Uh, one of them is just, you know, life is so busy uh, already and can be overwhelming. And I'm sure there's a bunch of folks on the call tonight that were like, uh, almost didn't come here for whatever reason or excuse, you know, uh, something was calling at you, your kids, another obligation, you're just tired and burnt out at the end of a day of work. Um, so I, I'd imagine some people here maybe relate to that story. So that was one reason I, I almost didn't put this together. And then the other one is just, you know, one of my biggest concerns in the world right now is the social divide that we're seeing. And hunting has the potential to be kind of a polarizing topic. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions around what hunting is actually all about. Um, and there's a lot of really strong opinions about hunting. And for the exact same two reasons that I was hesitant, I also knew that I had to do this and put it out to the world. Uh, so for the first reason, you know, is with life being so busy, if not now, then when? Hunting has been one of the most influential parts of my journey as an adult, uh, and it's influenced me in such deep and profound ways and, and really influenced who I am as a human being. So how could I be a teacher and not share that with the world? And the second part of it comes from a mentor of mine that said, you know, if something scares you, it probably means it's important. And I was a little bit nervous and scared to, you know, kind of go public with my journey into hunting. Uh, and one of my mentors said, well, maybe that's the exact reason that this is something that you should be going forward with. Um, maybe you are called to do this. So that's why I put this series together. And, you know, when I chatted with Daniel about a week ago to get ready for this, he had just come back from being out on a, a hunt over in Standing Rock territory um, with a guy named Travis Good Bull Moon uh, Corden, I believe his name is. I uh, might be mispronouncing that. And so, you know, Daniel shows up and we just have this 10 minute check in and I can just tell that Daniel's exhausted. You know, he just drove back across the country. Uh, he's got a buffalo in his car or pieces of it in a freezer. He needs to go and process it. Um, and he mentions that, yeah, we just really dropped a podcast about this hunt. So in my mind, I'm like, man, I've never hunted buffalo. Wow. I want to jump on thinking I'm coming on to learn about, you know, the tactics and the skills of going on a buffalo hunt. And as soon as I get on there, I have this deep remembering about why hunting is about so much more than just meals and so much more than tactics for me. Because he starts chatting with this gentleman, Travis, and they dive into topics around culture, around history, around deep relationship with the land. Um, and it's a, it's a real, really drives home for me, you know, why hunting is about so much more than just a meal or just feeding yourself. You know, it's this ancient relationships that humans have had with the land. And for myself personally, uh, I'll say it's been nothing short of healing in my own personal life journey. Uh, often in this modern world that feels so crazy and hectic, uh, my hunting is my sacred time where I go out and I actually process the world. And there's so many teachings beyond uh, bringing home food uh, that are just so impactful on my life. I feel like there's this annual cycle every fall where I get to like regenerate as a human being through the amount of time that I get to spend out in the woods uh, and through all the lessons that come from just sitting quietly in nature, you know? Um, so that's one of the many reasons I think it's so important. I, I really do think hunting is medicine for this modern world and the chaos of it, uh, as long as that we're doing it uh, in, as caretakers and as stewards of the land. So I'm going to introduce Daniel in a couple of minutes. Actually, Caleb's going to introduce Daniel, but I'm going to pass it over to him and we're going to have him speaking a good chunk of the rest of the night. Um, but I want to just leave you with one thought before I, I kind of pass it over to Caleb and Daniel here. So I'm going to guess that you're here for a reason right now. You know, that there's some sort of deep pull uh, that pulls you towards this practice of hunting, because it's not actually a normal or common thing in the modern world. Uh, and for me, it definitely was that, you know, I went from being a vegetarian of eight years to all of a sudden having this little inkling inside of me that just got stronger and stronger and stronger. And it almost pulled me down this path 
to the point now that hunting is such a big part of my lifestyle really year round. And I want to encourage you not to ignore that because in this modern world, it's really, really easy to be distracted from those subtle little things that are pulling at our heart, you know, pulling at our soul, but it might just be uh, the medicine that you need to help you process uh, what's going on and to prepare you for whatever's around the next corner. I know it's been that for me. Um, so I wanted to encourage you to listen to whatever pulled you here tonight. So I could keep going all night. You guys know how excited I get. I'm super passionate. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do right now is actually introduce you to a good buddy of mine, Caleb Musgrave. Caleb is the other uh, lead instructor with the Hunter's Journey training and course that we run. Uh, we're just starting up the 2021 cohort right now. Uh, so registration is going to be open the next few days for that. Um, and we have uh, Dr. Kersey Lawrence, who actually Daniel interviewed on his podcast. Uh, she's going to be coming on with us on Monday for all the people in the course to dive deep into the realm of tracking um, and understanding how to read the landscape and reading topography in context to hunting. Um, so Caleb is a part of that program. He's also the co-host of the show. So I'm going to pass it over to Caleb just to say hello, introduce himself, and then he's going to get things going by asking uh, Daniel the first question here. So I'll pass it over to you, Caleb. Hello, Anine, everyone. I just want to say hello and welcome to everyone that's joining us. This is our final free session, our final uh, get together for this series online. Uh, and so I'm really excited. This is like a really cool culmination of the last few weeks. And it's really, really cool that we have Daniel for that. Um, Daniel, I've heard of since about 2012. I was hearing from my friend Arthur Haynes about this guy. And I started seeing his name popping up online on some videos on YouTube and stuff. Start checking. I was like, man, this guy's tattooed. He's got long hair. He actually cares about the food he's eating. This is really cool. So the fact that Chris was able to drag him in here and have, his have him join us for this final episode, this is really cool for me. Um, so my name is Caleb Musgrave from Hiawatha First Nation. I'm a Mississauga Ojibwe uh, hunter, trapper, food gatherer in any way, shape, or form. I'm often called a food getter because we don't like the terms harvest. We're not really big on that term in my culture. It's something we already talked about in the past, but uh, when it comes down to it, wild food is a big part of my life. It's a big part of my livelihood. It's a big part of my identity in many ways. And so when Chris asked me to join in on the hunter's journey, this was a dream come true. This is one of my favorite subjects to teach about. This is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. Uh, you can tell because I'm a hand talker and I'm excited and now my hands are going everywhere. So clearly this is something I care about, something I really enjoy. And to have Daniel here with us just makes it even cooler. So thank you so much. First of all, before we go into anything else, I want to thank you, Daniel, for joining us tonight. This is really, really awesome. Uh, the first question I have for you, I had to write it down because I'm a little excited. So I've heard you say on your podcast that wild food is more than a meal. And from hearing you speak, it clearly does mean more to you. So what does being wild fed mean to you? Wow. Well, first, I just want to say hello to everybody. Chris, thank you so much, man. I, you know, Caleb, that, uh, that was a pretty awesome intro for me. Um, you know, I have a TV show and a podcast called Wild Fed, and I, I think of it kind of like um, the concept of we say like a cow is grass fed, you know, and I was thinking, how do I want to what do I want to call my brand? And it's like wild fed, you know, fed by the wild. And um, what does that mean for me? Uh, it's a lot more than food. It's uh, about relationships. And what I mean by that is, you know, we get this opportunity to be sort of incarnated here on Earth. And uh, this planet's a place we share with all of these other species, from the smallest ones we can't see to the big ones like bison and blue whales, you know, there's all these species here. And um, hunting and foraging, gathering for me has in it's been an opportunity to actually get to have meaningful and intimate relationships with non-human persons, non-human species, you know, other creatures. When I look at our big cities, New York City, for instance, I got to go to this weekend. And um, I look around that city and what I see is mostly people. I see a handful of dogs and cats and a few ginkgo trees and the rest is humans. And it makes me sad because we're not meant to live in this species isolation. So we you know we look at a CAFO farm and we go, hey, those cows aren't meant to live in isolation from their environment. Those cows aren't meant to be separated from all the other species. And then also from all of the, the plants and the fungi, all those things, we see cows on a feedlot and it's really sad to us. It's like, open your eyes when you look at the city and what do you see? You see humans in like a CAFO operation, a high intensity feeding operation for human labor almost. 
and people are devoid of these relationships to all of these other species. So that the environment and the idea of wildlife becomes incredibly abstract to people. And uh, I have found for me, and I, you know, I can't speak for other folks. Um, one of the things about hunting is it's a deeply personal thing and the way that each one of us hunts is going to be different and that's good and that's okay. Um, but what I found for me is that uh, while I loved backpacking and I loved um, canoeing and I loved hiking and climbing and doing all these things in the outdoors, there was something always missing for me. I wasn't developing meaningful relationships with the other creatures that I shared the landscape with. Once I started to hunt those things, forage those things, gather those things and actually bring them into my body and make my body out of those creatures, the intimacy of that connection became really real for me. It's like, now I know those species. Today, uh, I was out hunting squirrels and coming home with those squirrels. They're on the stove right now. You know, I'll be having them tonight. Um, what, you know, for me, I'm partially, I'm made of squirrels. So it's like the squirrel nation is part of me, part of my body. I'm a friend to the squirrels. I'm a, a, an ally to squirrels and squirrels are a friend to me. And so when I'm walking down the street and I see a squirrel in the park, what that squirrel means to me is a lot different than what it means to somebody who's never hunted a squirrel before. And it's funny because there's an interesting paradox here. I think some people would go like, some people are confused by that. Yeah, but you kill them. It's like, yeah, but I also would defend them because I know them, you know, because I know them very well. And because uh, I'll, I'll always go to bat for them because they're uh, meaningful to me. I'm partially made of them. So I'm in relationship with them. I'm in a reciprocal relationship with them. And a lot of people will say that they love wildlife, but they mean it kind of like they love their car. It's like this really abstract thing. So yeah, to me, being wild fed is about more than the food that I eat. The food's just a mechanism for me to get the carbon and the micronutrients and the macronutrients that I need to build my body but there's uh, very meaningful, deep relationships with other species. And I think if we don't have that, something's missing inside of us. And the problem is when something's missing, nature abhors a vacuum. So we'll try to fill it. We're going to try to fill that space with other things. And so, um, you know, when Chris said that hunting can be medicine, it really resonates for me because I see that non-hunters still hunt, but what they hunt and what they go to acquire, what they try to take, what they try to harvest ends up being commercial goods, ends up being other people, ends up being um, money, but not meaning, ends up being um, predatory ladder climbing because we are predators. So if we don't have that filled, we're going to predate on other things. You know, you want to see it go out to any bar room on a Saturday night and watch the men hunt those non-hunters, watch how they behave. And you'll see, oh, that's the hunter instinct misdirected. If they had that correct relationship, that right relationship with the natural world, if people had that in general, I think we would see a lot less of that divisiveness that you were talking about before. It can be very, very humbling to approach the world in this way. So uh, yeah, for me, it's about feeling like I'm not just an observer, but I'm actually part. And there's no separation when you get to my skin from the environment because my skin is made out of these creatures that I'm eating and everything under the skin down to the core of my bones is made out of these creatures. And so I, you can't separate me from the squirrels that I eat. I'm, I am those squirrels in a sense. And so uh, now I know where I belong because, you know, I didn't grow up hunting. I didn't start until pretty recently in my life. And, uh, you know, it'll probably be a few more seasons before every atom in my body comes from, you know, something that I pursued, but I'm getting there. And uh, I feel um, now like uh, at peace with the world. Uh, it's a bit of a paradox, but it's something that's very experientially felt. Yeah, I can relate to so much of that, you know, and um, yeah, uh, I guess the, the one thing I'm thinking about there, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time talking, but thinking about stories, you know, I've always been an outdoors person, even when I lived in the cities, I always appreciated nature, but I didn't realize how much I didn't know and how much of connection I was missing until I started actually pursuing animal for food. 
And, you know, you just start asking questions. You know, if you, it's one thing to see a deer in a field, you know, maybe something that I even didn't realize until I started hunting, you know, I thought like, oh yeah, I see deer all the time, but I never really asked really deep questions about them. Like I just saw them and then I read information. So I knew information about deer and I thought deer were really beautiful, but suddenly it's like, okay, I want to get close enough to put an arrow in that deer. And then a million questions come up like, well, wh where does that deer go? What made it run now? But it didn't run last time, you know? And well, where's the deer today? Like in this weather or the winds blowing from here right now? Like how many deer actually are there? Like, is that one deer? How old is that deer? Like, I just never would have asked any of those questions in my old lifestyle of just being an outdoors person that enjoyed it. And once I started hunting, it just really, really increased the, um, the naturalistic knowledge that I had to acquire about the land and thus the relationship of it. And then, and till I got to the point where I felt like, wow, I'm actually part of the food chain now, you know, in a real visceral way. And there's, there's sometimes risks, even when you go out hunting, you know, um, I've been close to hurting myself fairly badly out in the bush before, you know, and there's something about entering yourself back into the food chain in this real intentional and visceral way that, um, you know, it, it nourishes my soul, like very few other things. Uh, you know what I think I'd like to do, you know, I, I really want to make sure that these sessions are super practical for the people showing up and they feel like they can go home with takeaways. And I know a lot of people in the audience tonight, have never hunted before, or maybe they're just getting going. Uh, a lot of folks here probably come from urban environments and maybe don't have mentors in their lineage being brought up. Uh, so they might have kind of perceived barriers for, for being able to start to hunt. And it's kind of overwhelming when you're getting started. So you, you mentioned actually a moment ago, Daniel, that you weren't brought up hunting. You started later on in life. So, so what did that look like for you to go from a guy that just has this pull, this interest and having to figure out how the heck to, how the heck to do this, you know, and yeah. maybe the second part of that question, were there any barriers that you had, whether they were real or just in your head that you had to figure out how to overcome? Uh, and my hope is in, in answering that, maybe you'll be able to help some other folks overcome some of their own barriers or, or help them envision themselves being able to step in this process when they really don't know how they would get started at this point in life or, or where they are in life. Yeah, so I didn't start hunting until my late 30s. Um, so this is the uh, conclusion of my sixth hunting season. Uh, if you're wondering, like, hey, okay, so wait a second, you've hunted six years. How? What's you know? What? How do you get to be here, being part of this course? Um, I've I've been very blessed with a, a rapid learning curve with some great mentors. Um, today I have a hunting show on cable. It's amazing to me that if you follow the adult learning process, uh, it's possible to advance really quickly. Now, a few things that I want to say that I had going for me in advance of this was that I had spent time in the woods. Um, I had uh, some skills from, you know, knife skills and fire skills and orientation type skills. And I'd spent some years shooting too. And those things have helped me advance pretty quickly. But when it came to interacting with animals, you know, I had been a forager for a long time. I didn't really know much about the animals around me at all, to be honest. And um, I had to come to it as an adult learner. So, um, you know, the first thing that I did was uh, get a hunter safety certificate. Uh, that's kind of the first thing. And I tell people today, hey, if you have any desire in your heart to hunt ever, go do a hunter safety course now. And the reason I say that is because once you have that, you know, and for folks who are outside of North America, you know, I can't speak to the systems where you are, but I'll say for Canadian and US folks, once you have a hunter safety course under your belt, which is a very simple thing. And today in the COVID era, a lot of that's online. Once you do that, now you can get a hunting license in any state or province or territory so that you can now rapidly jump into the hunt when an opportunity emerges. So one thing I worry about with folks is um, they, they would like to hunt sometime. They're putting off that hunter safety course. And then uh, all of a sudden I go, hey, I'm going turkey hunting next week. Do you want to go? And you're like, yeah, I do. What do I got to do again? And it's like, you got to do a hunter safety course and there's not one available and now you can't go. So do that now. I did mine five years before my first hunt. You know, there got to be a point where it's like, am I ever even going to use this thing? And then the opportunity started to roll for me. So that's the first thing I say to folks. The next thing is, um, I think it's really important to be able to be humble because you're going to need mentors uh, and you're going to need to be useful to those people and you're going to need to be a good listener. So uh, one of the things for me that really helped me advance uh, getting through those barriers was just telling other hunters that I wanted to hunt. And the hardest part for me 
was that I was coming from a different uh, perspective and background than most of the people that, that make up the hunting demographic where I live. I feel really blessed and honored to be part of the changing hunting demographic. Um, you know, what you said before about me having long hair and tattoos, it's like, that's not, you know, when I go into the outfitting store, when I go to Cabela's or Bass Pro Shop, I don't see a lot of people that look like me. You know, I'm a different type, but I'm seeing more of it and the demographics now changing. Just seeing some of the handles of the people coming in as you kind of came into this call tonight, you know, I saw a lot of names that I, that kind of let me see a little bit even clearer how that demographic's changing. Who's getting drawn to this? Um, that old, whatever you have in your mind of the stereotype of that hunter that has kept you from wanting to hunt, there's a couple things I want to say about it. So there's that Elmer Fudd kind of I concept, you know, there's that, um, there's that bigoted redneck hunter kind of concept or that trophy hunter that a lot of people uh, are really turned off by who would like to start hunting. There's two things here. One is that um, a lot of that's perception and you get alone with these people and you go on a hunt with them and you see them cry when they make a kill. And you realize, oh, there's more to these people than the fashion statement that has been part of the group that they've identified with. Then you see them walk over there and do their grip and grin photo. And you're like, oh, now I see it's that photo that used to, that was what was in my head, but I didn't realize their eyes were glassed over from crying a minute before that. So it's not always what it looks like. The other thing is that you I have had to tolerate a lot of things that I, that I don't really necessarily agree with or haven't totally resonated with me. And I've really resisted the urge to feel like it's my job to get in there and tell my mentors how they should hunt or how they should approach what they do. So I've just come in as a learner and people really resonate with that. And they'll very quickly want to share with you what they do because learning to hunt is a, a complex thing one of the most important things is actually going out with somebody and seeing how it's done i can't imagine like if i had tried to piece together my bear hunts on my own or piece together my deer hunts on my own how long it would have taken to be successful i really believe it's important to be successful early in so you have those strong anchor points and uh being successful early on Outside of beginner's luck, it means going out with people who know what they're doing, who can show you how to find animals, who can show you, you know, the sign those animals leave, the spore they leave on the ground, uh, that can show you what those animals eat, when they eat it, that can, the, all those little details, you need somebody who can help you do that. And it's not always going to be the same person. At least it hasn't been for me. So I could tell you about my turkey mentors. I could tell you about my bear mentors. I can tell you about my bison mentor. I can tell you about my squirrel mentor. Every, every hunt that I've done, you know, there's been different folks who have taught me. Uh, something that my friend Arthur Haynes taught me, though, a long time ago, he said, hey, you know, in the absence of elders for us, um, books often become our elders. Uh, you know, for a lot of us podcasts, YouTube videos. So I utilize all of that stuff. I really, really do. And, um, you know, uh, as was just mentioned a few minutes ago, and I'm just so proud to have uh, this bull in our house now, but I just got back from a bison hunt out on Standing Rock and got to bring this fella into the house with us, his skull and of course all his meat. And going into that, was like, how do I uh, quickly get up to speed? Because once I get around folks that are doing this, I want to be able to speak the language because I don't want to start at uh, kindergarten. I want to jump in and have the language, the lexicon. I want to know a little bit about what I'm doing before I get there so they don't have to start me at the very beginning. So what's that look like? For me, it looks like I want to know about this animal today. So I might grab a book like uh, Steve Vernella's book here, um, Hunting, Butchering, Cooking, Wild Game. This is the first um, volume. And you know, there's a great section on buffalo in there. So that's buffalo today. And it tells me about, hey, where are these animals today? Where are the hunts? What are the rules for the hunts? Where can I put in for tags? All that kind of information. 
But I also want to know, hey, what's the backstory of that animal? So maybe I turn to a book like American Serengeti by Dan Flores, and I can read about bison sort of pre-contact. What was happening here in North America with bison? How big were the herds? You know, what's the story there? Maybe I want to go even deeper and learn about how the people really interacted with them. So I'll pick up a book like this. It might be on audio, might be written, but I'm going to be inculcating myself with information about that species as I get closer. You know, right now I'm reading about the Pleistocene era and who were bison before the modern era. I get so nerded out. It's like bison toys, bison stickers. I inculcate myself. I flood myself. So if you went through my library, you'd be like, oh, there's all the books he got when he learned to hunt squirrels. There's all the books he got when he learned to hunt turkeys. There's all the books, you know, on and on and on. And maybe that's me on Google Scholar pulling, you know, research from biologists by podcasting. I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of people. But if I didn't podcast myself, I'd be going to other people's shows. Hey, do they have a show on turkeys? Do they have a show on turkeys? Do they have a show on turkeys? And pull all that information in. I become like a vortex for information. And I draw that in so that by the time I'm actually going out, it's like I know a little bit about it. And that really helps me to feel like um, I can kind of jump a couple of levels because the thing is, I didn't start uh, as a little kid seeing, you know, these animals butchered in the yard. I didn't start seeing my family coming home with these animals. I didn't grow up learning to do it. I wasn't in the field as a five, six, seven year old with my dad. I didn't, I didn't get any of that. So starting this late in life, in my late 30s, now I'm 42, I'll be 43. I just turned 43. And I, I don't have time to, to go all the way back and start over. So I'm looking for how do I kind of jump ahead in a way where I can learn as much as quickly as I can about these animals. And so um, that's a big, big piece for me. The barriers to entry a lot of time are um, easier to overcome than you think. But a big part of it is being around the people that do it and the information. And I think uh, a lot of times people just think, oh, I'll, I'll learn that stuff when I go out there. And that's not my approach. And I'm not saying my approach is the right approach, but that's how, that's how I like to do it. Right on. I had another question for you, but uh, you kind of answered it already. Uh, was my, my question was, so you've had the privilege of hunting all over North America, hunting countless species. Do you mind walking us through what you do to begin target, uh, targeting and hunting a new species for you? And you kind of explained that with the books and the information, of course, mentors. Um, I, I really enjoy that, uh, that aspect where you said like the books can be our elders. There's, like you said, YouTube channels, there's, there's uh, videos of all kinds all over the place. There's books from all kinds of authors from all different perspectives for me who has been an author that you frequently pick up that you yeah. regardless of the species regardless of who you're targeting this month or this week or this next hunt who's someone that you frequently go back to to refer back to or maybe other books that they brought out it could be a modern author it could be an author from 50 years ago 100 years ago whoever it may be or yeah. knowledge holder of any kind who's someone that you refer back to quite a bit well, I would like to kind of look at it more like a spectrum because sure. the way I see it is like, I want to go to that full redneck bud guy. I want to see what he does. What's his approach? You know why? Because he's going to have the down and dirtiest approach that works. So here's the thing. The folks that I know that want to do things in the most pure way, it might be the word, or sometimes you might say like the most primitive type of way or they want to do it in the most spiritual type of way. Those folks are often not exceptionally effective in my experience. I was recently had a friend over who has been very involved in the primitive skills and tracking world. And uh, we were having this conversation. Why are those people often not hunters? You know, we're talking about people who they made the moccasins they're wearing from buckskin that they made themselves from the self bow that they have. They make their arrows. They're doing, they're napping their flint. They're doing all of it, but they don't hunt. My friend took a master tracker class. I mean, that this, he's in the cyber tracker program. This is very advanced stuff. I, I eventually said to him like, Hey man, so when are you going to start hunting? Like, what are you, what are you doing with these skills? And I realized that some people are trying to reverse engineer it from the ground up. 
I, it's not that I don't respect that approach. I do, but I also want to eat wild game. We eat wild game in this house. Right. And so that's what we eat for meat. So for me to do that, I need to be effective. So I want to meet that guy who goes out and he just punches tags and I don't care like what his approach is. I just want to see it. Then I want to see the person on the other end of that whose approach is much more reverent. I want to, I want to hear, or maybe they don't hunt at all. Like maybe I'm just going to hear from the biologists, you know, by the way, in the state or province where you live, there are wildlife managers, wildlife biologists, they work for you. If you want to talk to them, ring them up. They have to talk to you. You, They're funded by you and by the dollars you spend by buying hunting licenses and fishing licenses. And they're there to support you in addition to working with the wildlife. So don't hesitate to reach out. These people are assets to you, as are the wardens who oversee and protect that wildlife on your behalf. The really cool thing about North America is the the way it works legally is all the animals on the landscape are owned in trust by the people. And so when you go take an animal off the landscape, what you're essentially doing, when I went out today and hunted squirrels, what I was basically doing is making a withdrawal from the people's squirrel bank. I'm not saying that's how it works spiritually, but that's how it works legally. So if I want a deer, that deer is owned by the people collectively. But once I shoot it and put my tag on it, I make a withdrawal. It's now my deer, right? So we hire wardens to oversee that for us to make sure no one's robbing the bank, so to speak, by poaching. So that person's also at your disposal. So you can talk to those folks, right? So you can talk to the folks from the pure science side, and then you can talk to the hunters who are just getting it done down and dirty and everybody in between. And I like that because I want to know how to get out there and make it happen. I don't like coming. I don't, I'm just, I don't have, again, I'm in my forties. I don't have enough time to learn so slow that I never get to eat wild game. And I know people like that who just, I would, I would explain my method and they would go, no, I don't want to do it that way. I'm going to do it like, or I'm, I'm too introverted to talk to people. I'd be like, okay, well, let's see what happens, you know, and uh, very, very long learning curve. So getting out there with people who are effective, even if you don't like their methods. What I mean by that is uh, I have friends who taught me to turkey hunt. They don't eat turkey. I don't know why they want to kill turkeys, but they do. So rather than tell them that they're doing it wrong or they're doing it bad or what would be more pure, how to honor turkeys, I live it. And I let myself be the demonstration, but I don't need to run my mouth about it. But what I will do is say, hey, guys, why don't you pass those turkeys on to me when you're done? You know, can I butcher them for you? Can I help in some way? Do you want me to clean? Maybe I can clean up those breasts and give them to you guys um, and give you a recipe even, but I'll take those legs or I'll take those carcasses or whatever it is, you know, those kind of things. I'll clean that skull for you You let and give you the back straps. Let me take those hindquarters, whatever, whatever it is, you know. Um, and I'm not above doing things like I, I'll also add... Um, you know, getting on the phone with your local dispatch and saying, hey, can I get on the roadkill list? You know, if you really want to eat game. So don't be afraid to get down and dirty. You don't have to do everything for in a pair of moccasins you made with a bow you made yourself. Like that's, to me, that's, um, those are very advanced skills. And I, I would like to get there eating game, not shopping at the supermarket, hoping one day I'll get good enough to harvest game with my stick bow. Because that might not ever happen. And I'm probably not going to be eating ducks that way. I'm probably not going to be eating. There's, you know, quite a few species. I'm probably not going to get that way. Right. So, Mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm just open to all the tactics. I don't, um, I just ask myself what's ethical and what's legal. And I'm not afraid to use the range of tools that will work and the the range of tactics. So uh, let me sit, let's put it like this. Let's say you don't necessarily like how somebody hunts deer, but you're willing to go learn from them. You get your first deer. Now you have a success. Now you've got the meat in the freezer. Now next season, you can back off a little bit and go, Hey, how do I get more aligned with my own approach? Like what's in my heart to do? Because you're not hungry. What I don't want to do is be like, this is the only way I'll do it. So I'm going to go buy beef now because I don't have any venison. So that to me is something I've seen a lot. Um, so, you know, I might go to, um, the the meat eater show for instance the steve Vernella crowd and see what those guys are doing 
You know, how are they doing it? You know, it was really interesting to read Steve Rinella's book, um, American Buffalo, <laughs> before going buffalo hunting. But then it was really awesome to go to Standing Rock and talk to the Dakota people. And hey, what's the story there? What's you, what does it mean to you? How do you guys like to approach it? Um, and get those kind of that sort of bookends so that I get, okay, here's one end. Here's the other end. Who, who am I? in this because we're all different. Where do I want to land? Where do I resonate? And I find that I'm a little bit different, you know, so some people are comfortable to get in a helicopter and gun hogs from the sky with ARs. That's not me, you know, but I, I'm not above using my thermal optics at night. I have them. I'm not afraid to use those, you know, like to me, there's nothing. Um, I don't like um, to get, I don't like to apply, how do I say this? Uh, I don't like to be a Puritan. And I think sometimes people do that. They'll, they, they have a vision of something from the 1500s or before the 1400s or before in their mind of how they want it to look. And it just doesn't really look that way anymore. And I think there's something about accepting that uh, and then working your way back from there rather than trying to do it in the other, on the other side. So I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, it answers your question, but I, I kind of like, I, I don't have any one author. I like to, I like to go like who, you know, for instance, I, I picked up this book a minute ago. I'm on bison because that's what's fresh in my mind. But this was a neat book. It was a deep historical, um, a deep environmental history on bison. There's 15 authors in here, all scientists, you know, each one giving a different perspective. And it's so helpful rather than hearing from one person. I like to hear from a lot of different people because everybody's got a little different piece for you. Excellent. I've got a thought on where I want to go with that, but K Caleb, is there anything you wanted to share just coming off what Daniel did there? Or? That was really, really well thought out. And I really like your approach of saying, okay, let's just get to the point where I'm actually having successful hunts and then let's see where I can dial it back. <laughs> it's a very pragmatic answer. It's a really practical and efficient way to do it. And it's something that a lot of people can actually do. They can go out and start duck hunting with a, with a, with a borrowed shotgun tomorrow if they have the licensing already lined up they can go tomorrow with those guys in their neighborhood that they're not sure if that's how they want to hunt but they can see how they're doing it and then build off of that because it's such an easy way to at least first and foremost have a successful hunt but also start figuring out where you stand on the ethics of that style of hunting mm -hmm. i really appreciate how you put how you put that i'm glad you did that cool yeah, and that, that kind of feeds in nicely to what I wanted to kind of share there. Because, you know, when I started out, I actually started out, I guess you could, what you called the Puritan kind of pathway, you know. Um, I had it set that, you know, uh, for whatever reason, I was a vegetarian for eight years. I, I didn't have hunting in my culture, in my upbringing, in my family. Um, you know, not unless you trace it back, you know, a thousand years over the biggest. Uh, yeah, season. yeah. Otherwise, we all do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so for when, when I started out, I actually, for whatever reason in my head, I was like, no, bow hunting is like the only ethical way to hunt. And I'm going to carve a bow from a stick and I'm going to harvest my first deer. And for myself personally, I'm really thankful that I actually started it from the opposite spectrum, but it took me five years to get my first deer. But where I wanted to go with that is actually, as I started to spend time actually out hunting, I realized how many judgments I had about different types of hunting. And because I didn't actually have that deep relationship with ecology, and understanding how ecosystems work, understanding sustainability, understanding these animals and the, what their lives like really looked in day in, day out. I actually had all these preconceived ideas around, oh, this being un is unethical over here. And I don't like that. And oh, that guy's just whatever, a Yahoo redneck because he acts this way. And as I actually started interacting with these people and learning, suddenly I realized like, oh, I, I was actually quite arrogant when I went at it in my Puritan way. And I'm not by any means saying that it's arrogant to go at it in that, that Puritan way. I, I actually have a ton of respect for that, but myself, yeah. I'll, I'll own that. You know, I was a little bit arrogant. Um, and over time, as I learned more, as I met people, I actually realized, you know, you know, there's actually like, uh, yeah, I had a lot of judgments that actually just weren't grounded in actual knowledge about hunting and ecology. Um, so I can appreciate that as well. And I very much come from the same approach, like make everyone your teacher, um, be open to like, well, what don't I know? I've got this judgment. I think this guy's a redneck or I think that's unsustainable. Uh, and you know, the number of times I've done that and then I've hung out with the person and then yeah, a really, really quick story. And then I'm going to ask you a question here, but um, I got to go and hang out with this 70 year old Irishman the other night on a goose hunt. Um, so a buddy of mine met him. He invited me to come up and I get there and, you know, he's sitting on the porch all done up in camo. Um, and there was something about the way that he said, and I was just like, oh man, you know, like my first judgment is like, oh, who's this redneck? We're going to be hanging out for the night. You know, and he was kind of crude in the way that he talked and like, 
you know, had this like almost like this dominionistic kind of approach. But then we go out on that hunt that evening and we had a successful hunt of the goose. And like he literally had a bit of a tear coming out of his eye. And it wasn't because we were successful. It was actually because he just watched these tongue, two young boys that he brought out of the way. I mean, we're 40, but he's 70. So he just witnessed these two young boys. And I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was something to like, you know, this is, this means the world to me that I was just able to share this experience and we're watching the sun go down. And like, we're just having this real solid bonding experience. Uh, and I realized that this guy actually like cares about the geese. He cares about the earth. He cares about people. And sure, he comes across in this little crude way. I could judge him really quickly, but is that actually what his heart is or what his soul is? Or is that what my brain is saying, you know? Um, so that, that's what kind of comes to mind with me and just being open-minded. And, you know, those judgments might be a barrier for people on the crowd learning from different people. And if you, um, if you were to just totally empty your cup and be open, then you're probably going to learn faster. You're going to get there quicker. And then, you know, you might come back around and say, no, I, I actually still feel strong about that. Like, I still do think that guy's a redneck or that's unethical. But you, at least you came at it with an open cup and you worked backwards and got yourself to the point um, where, where you're able to stand in that opinion with some integrity in it. So yeah, can, I, can I add something to that real quick? Oh, sure, please. please. Like, so let's say that you you have all those judgments. Um, I can just, I really resonate with what you're saying. I've had <laughs> very similar experiences. Let's say that you have those kind of judgments. Uh, well, I'm not going to do, I want to do it pure. I want to do it this way. I want to do it that way. As you what? Drive to the supermarket in your gas uh, gasoline car using the GPS from your, you know, factory made phone, right? Like we're, we're so involved in so many unethical things. And then people turn to hunting and they're like, oh, but this I'm going to do perfectly pure. It's like, man, we're all tainted by all of this stuff, right? So again, like, where's your heart at? And uh, there are teachers all around you. And also remember that there's a lot of generational stuff going on here too. One of the things that drives me kind of crazy about the modern world is that people today don't realize they were born at the top of the pyramid of the hierarchy of needs. So it's real easy being born into this much excess to focus on spirit and to focus on love and not to have to think about what generations before us went through, which was extreme poverty, hand to mouth, kind of, you know, the Great Depression, World War II, all this kind of stuff that people live through. And so that stuff still touches their generations. And we were born, many of us sort of like into very easy times where we got to focus on our personal development, our self growth, all those kind of things. We, it's, it's not wise to project that onto former generations, in my opinion. So know that those people have seen things that you haven't had to go through or see in your lifetime yet. And uh, it's wise to just go, hey, I don't know why they're like that but I'm going to try to meet them heart to heart. And uh, you'll find you have teachers everywhere. And, and maybe that 99% of what you get from those folks isn't great, but that 1% might be worth everything. And you might be surprised, you know, I got to tell you the guy that I thought was the biggest redneck around uh, walked my wife down the aisle uh, in the end. So the kind of relationships you develop might not be based on being similar type of characters might be based on a similar type of heart. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, Daniel, tonight's disappearing so quickly here. Uh, and there's two really big questions I'd like to ask you. And then I'd like to, hopefully we have a little bit of time for a Q&A at the end. Yeah, great. Um, so the first, I'm going to just uh, front load you with both questions. Um, and then if you get lost and forget what the question is, if you want to pause and say, hey, am I still on point? Or what was that other thing? Then feel free to do that. Uh, so question number one is uh, around stewardship and sustainability. And I think it was Lori asked in the crowd is like, how do we, are people going to be able to hunt 50 to 100 years from now? So, you know, when you're hunting in your own backyard, it's pretty easy to be tapped into, you know, wildlife populations if you know how to track and you spend time out there. Uh, a lot of people don't hunt in their own backyard. They travel to go there. So when you're traveling to a hunt, how do you ensure that you're actually able to do that in, uh, as a caretaker and as a steward and you know that there's populations there to sustain it so that future generations can hunt? So that's question number one. Uh, and then question number two, you know, you kind of started to talk about this pathway from like finding a new species and all the research you did. But I'm wondering, knowing that we're short on time, if you could break down like steps as succinctly as possible, like, okay, you're, you wanna go hunt uh, a buffalo in, uh, on the West Coast, or I'm gonna go hunt a sheep in the mountains, or I wanna go hunt a squirrel or a grouse or whatever it is. Like if you were able to break that down and just some really clear steps in a pathway uh, for, for a new hunter, what might that look like? Okay. Well, first I want to say that um, when I think about 50 years from now, you know, is hunting still going to be around and sustainable? 
Um, my concerns are a lot more social than they are ecological. And that's because we have a really good system in place. Our North American model of conservation is far from perfect, but it's the best in the, the only thing that's been better was, was the pre-contact thing that we could look at here in North America. We could go, hey, that was really sustainable. But outside of that, you know, because that world, that it's different now. Looking at um, civilization in its current form, North America has probably the best stewardship model for wildlife that allows for everybody to still participate. Now, keep in mind that these biologists every year are looking at population dynamics and they are determining the number of animals that can be hunted within, um, with, without uh, drawing down on the population. So if there's too many hunters, or not enough animals, or both, they issue less tags. So right now in Maine, we have so many black bears here. We have more than any of the contiguous states, about 37,000 black bears. I can just go every year and buy a hunting license. It comes with a bear tag. I can get a bear over the counter, we call that. But you go to some other states, maybe you've got to wait five, six, seven years in a lottery draw to get a bear tag because they don't have the populations to sustain that. I'm not saying the system's perfect. I'm saying it's the best that's existed in this sort of modern era. And it's always self-improving. There are some politics around some animals. Wolves are an example. Things get a little tricky in some areas. But by and large, it's actually a pretty good system. So I'm less concerned about that part of it than I am concerned about pushback against hunting itself by folks who think it's cruel because they don't understand it's actually the opposite of cruel. Um, you know, this is a piece that uh, I'm really passionate about. But that doesn't mean that, um, let's say I want to go brook trout fishing, you know, in the mountain streams where I go, there isn't in the rule book, it doesn't, it says I can take five trout a day. It doesn't say I, I have to go and spread that take out. That's on me to do. So I could legally sit in the same hole and pull every trout out of that little bit of that little pool. But I know, hey, look, if I take the big trout out of there, there's three or four small one in there who are going to jump in to try to take its place. It's time for me to go to the next pool. And it's like I'm taking the cream off the top and I'm leaving the rest to grow up. And so it's similar to foraging. But the thing about foraging is it's totally unregulated. I'm more worried about the future of foraging than I am about the future of hunting because there aren't wardens out there and biologists out there making sure that the take is sustainable. I think that where you start is, you know, for me anyway, my approach, you start with what's legal and then you build what's ethical as you learn and you feel your way through it. But know that there are people with eyes on this and that's really helpful. So I think some people who are new to hunting or who are against hunting just think it's this random thing. We get to just go out there and kill whatever we want to kill. It's like, this is a highly regulated thing, which brings me to your second question. You know, how we start is, I mentioned before, getting your hunter safety course so that you have that. The next step is starting to look through, I, I think it's really good to start hunting at home if you can. So let's assume that's what you're going to do. I live in the state of Maine. So what I'm going to do is get Maine's hunting book for the year. They put one out every year. More and more, they're doing it digitally, but same kind of thing. I get that book and I read through it. It's going to walk me through who in the state's regulating this? How do they do it? Then it's going to talk to me about what are the rules? What do I need to wear? What calibers can I use? What method of take? If I'm going to bow hunt, am I going to gun hunt? How does that work? And then it's going to go through the species. What are the dates when I can harvest? What type of harvest in those dates? How many animals? What's the limit? All those kind of things. So that's where you want to start next. And what I recommend to new hunters is, hey, get familiar with what species are where you live because you might not know. You know, maybe, you know, there's deer there, but maybe you don't know, oh, there's snipe or woodcock or, hey, there's all these opportunities. It's not just mallards. There's eight different duck species here that I can hunt or, or, you know, there's all of this um, variety you may not know about. That's really helpful for me. When I started, it wasn't hunting. It, there was no hunting season going on, but in the state of Maine, you can hunt red squirrels, woodchucks and uh, one other species, porcupine, all year. They're open season, they call it. Uh, so I started going in the woods and harvesting red squirrels because it was open and I could just get to know a species. I could get started. I didn't want to wait until fall. 
you know? So get your local laws and start to see what are the, what are the species I can work with here? What are the dates? And then start to figure out what are you, what would you like to learn? From there, what I recommend is you've got the internet as a great resource. I know it's getting pretty overwhelming on there, but it's like, hey, maybe watch a few videos about it. Or as I mentioned, go to a podcast like mine, Wild Fed, go to Steve Rinella's podcast, Meat Eater, go somewhere like that. Go to a podcast and start to listen to episodes about that animal. You'd be amazed at how quickly you can get up to speed. In fact, you might know more at the end of a couple podcasts than most of the hunters who do it where you live know about that animal. That's what I found. I started to advance very quickly by just listening to conversations about these species and I knew what to anticipate. So that's another component of it. I recommend you don't go out and buy a bunch of equipment until you've had some time to play with some of the stuff. It's really good to see what other people use. Sometimes it's a matter of um, if you get real specialized, hey, the people who are real specialized have already figured out what the best stuff is. Check out what they're using or use other people's stuff when you can so you get a sense of what works for you and what doesn't. But then it's dialing in that kind of stuff. The biggest thing in hunting, I think, though, is really having spots, having locations that you can go. So spending some time out scouting is really important. It's one of the things I love about foraging. Um, or I know, Caleb, you were mentioning running trap lines. When you're out running a trap line, you're out foraging, you're seeing sign for the species that you're interested in. You're starting to see them like, hey, before squirrel season happening, I already know what kind of mast crop we're going to have for acorns, that that's what those squirrels need. I know it's going to be a good year or a bad year. I know where the, where the oaks are. I know where the squirrels are. I'm seeing them. I'm seeing the young ones running around. I'm watching them before, long before the season. So find a reason to be out there seeing what's out there. And just because you know people who hunt doesn't mean they know all the good spots because most hunters are pretty lazy. So if you're willing to go a little bit further, you like to hike, you like, you like to be in shape, you like to get out on the canoe, you can go find sweet spots that no one's really using. And the more of that stuff you have ahead of time, when it's finally time to kick into gear, man, you're going to be way ahead of the curve. So, um, but I really think probably getting your local state or provincial or territorial uh, hunting regs um, is the place to start. You might find there's four or five, six different animals there that you never even thought you could hunt. And um, one other component is like, I live in Maine, we have this amazing uh, moose population, but it's uh, once, twice, maybe three times in a life draw. I've never drawn. I put in every year. Um, you want to know about that because you want to start putting in now. You want to start accumulating points in these lottery systems, even if you're not hunting them yet. So, you know, it's helpful to know, oh, okay, the moose, I need to put in a tag. I need to put in for that tag. It's not one that I get with my license. So start doing that now because in five years when you draw, you'll probably be ready to do that. So get your local laws and, and learn them. Uh, Caleb, I wonder if you want to want to elaborate on that, or is there any questions coming up from you? I think we'll probably move into a, a question and answer session shortly here. I know there's a couple coming up in the crowd. Uh, I'm just curious if there's anything you wanted to jump in with here, Caleb. I, I kind of actually want to go back to one of our first uh, parts of the conversation, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, from my perspective, I understand that there's a lot of this paradoxical questioning of, well, if you if you love them, why are you killing them? And you brought that up earlier and Chris mentioned that as well. I kind of want to touch that from a different perspective because we're talking about a lot of this conversation that has been about perspective. From my perspective, that's never been brought up in my mind. And I'm not sure if that's because I was raised indigenous and we're, we're always consuming those animals in one form or another. And I loved how you brought up in that conversation, in this part of the, of the evening, the idea that you're driving a car to go get that meat, that meat's inside of a cellophane, a cellophane package, you're using a cell phone to find it, that the disconnect is already there. So the ethics are always going to be redundant in a sense. <laughs> it's really fascinating for me to hear this idea of paradox regarding passion and love for an animal and taking its life. We, we all love eating mushrooms. We all love eating uh, the wild food that we forage. And we never have that question. We have the, the question about ethics and how much can we really take, but you never hear a forager say, I really love this plant. And then somebody say back then, why are you eating it? <laughs> it's, a, it's a strange thing from my perspective to hear. And I hear it 
very often now that I, uh, I've been teaching with hunting for a few years, and I've been hunting since I was 11 or 12 years old, but teaching it over the last few years, that comment comes up quite a bit. Well, if you love it so much, why do you kill it? If you love that plant so much, why are you tearing it out of the ground and taking uh, from its life? And so I find it really refreshing your perspective, talking about this idea of there's all these different places that people are tainted by modern entity. It's a really fascinating subject. I, I also want to just point out, we, we are speaking from a point of privilege, all of us here, because yes, we all have access to the internet and we have access to, to available food. We are at the top of the hierarchy of needs. Not all of us. A lot of indigenous people in North America suffer from food insecurity. We don't. Like, look at me. I look like I'm definitely food secure for many, many months at a time without <laughs> having to eat. But when it comes down to food security, that's a huge part of why indigenous people continue to hunt because that is a local available food that we can easily access. And because it's something that's in our pedagogy, we understand that animal and we understand what we can take when we can take. And so a lot of what you're talking about, a lot of what this course that we've been talking about, the Hunter's Journey course that me and Chris teach is about trying to help people instill that pedagogy from a Western lens into their minds so thank you so much for bringing that stuff up thank you uh, can, for bringing beautiful comments yeah. to exactly what i've been looking for to say myself it's so hard for me to articulate something that i have never had to experience so thanks for that well i can if i could just add to that because uh, i'm so glad you said that having just come back from standing rock what really struck me there i wrote about it recently on my instagram uh well the first thing was the person who invited me out there you mentioned him before travis uh, good bull man condon you know, he says to me, he, well, I'm on a Zoom with him when we're first getting to know each other and he's got a buffalo skull behind him. He says, I want you to have one. And if somebody who didn't know saw that, they'd be like, oh, he must be like a trophy guy. It's like, no, that, had, that skull's for ceremony and prayer. You know, it's not, it's perspective, man. The second thing that really struck me was when I was out there, I was like, these people have never had a moral, they've never run into this thing you were talking about. They're, they, they, you could not tell the Lakota and Dakota they don't love the buffalo. They are they they are the buffalo. The they they would say things to me though that would you'd be like what like they'd be like they'd be talking about the buffalo as a sacred entity and then they'd be like oh dude blast him like no no pro, no conflict there like the idea that you would kill one and eat it is not like a there's no conflict with the love this is such a western idea and it's poisoned our minds in such a way that the people who will tell you oh you you're harming the earth by doing this are the ones who are harming the earth the most and that part is a crazy irony that i think gets settled by all of this so that thing you just said there um the the other one that comes up and you must this one must be something you hear all the time well you know the native americans or i guess the first nations they used every part of the animal it's like okay if i lived on the plains where we basically everything had to come from the buffalo yes okay but you don't have anybody come to you and be like hey listen you should really use every part of the kale like nobody feels like that. How come you're not using every part of the apple? It's like, no one says that. And when people go buy chicken and beef at the store, they don't feel a compulsion that they've got to use every part of that animal. They just buy the part they want. And so one thing that I have, I, I see as a huge barrier to entry is people are worried that they're not going to be able to use every single part of the animal. And I always like to just remind new hunters, look, you will learn to utilize more and more and more. But it's like, I have a dog. My dog consumes so much of the animals, that I, parts that I don't use, the coyotes back here, the fishers, the raccoons, everybody loves my house because there's food on the landscape, the bacteria, the fungi. We are feeding this ecosystem with the parts that we aren't using. I always learn to use more, utilize more, but it takes time if you, if one, you're not culturally needing to, and two, you don't know how to, don't let that part stress you out. And, uh, but, but back to you, Caleb, I just want to, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I was all, I was a vegan for many, many years, 10 years. I, I wrestled with this stuff so much and I'm finally realizing I, it was so healing for me. This bison means this bison in my house is not just meat and it's not just a skull, it's medicine. And one of the biggest, the most medicinal piece for me was, oh, it's okay to be excited to kill one and excited to eat one. And that doesn't take away uh, 
spiritually at any level. It's all one thing. It's all one thing. Beautiful. Um, so it's that time of the night. Chris, how long do we have to make sure that we get a few of the questions answered from the, from the audience? Oh, uh, you're muted. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, well, yeah, why don't we, we'll do a little Q&A with Daniel in, in just okay. a second here, but I'm going to just take a, a moment right now to just do a, a little bit of a segue piece right now. Sure. Um, we've been talking about this idea of mentorship being so important. Um, we just delivered this, uh, these, this four-part series, and all of those replays are up, and I encourage you to go through them in order if you're just joining us for the first time, because there's a very intentional flow to the way we laid it out. Uh, the first call, Caleb and I chatted about this idea that um, everyone has their own unique relationship with hunting their own story. And it's why we call our training and our course, the hunter's journey, not hunting 101. Uh, it's about so much more than the food. So in the, the first one, we basically kind of contrast Caleb's upbringing um, in an indigenous family hunting for substance and me uh, being somebody from Scotland and Hungary living over here in the modern world uh, and my relationship with it. Um, so we, we start to just kind of explore these different relationships with the land. In the second video with Sandy and Cal Reed, we dive deep into preparing yourself mentally to be able to actually take a life. And Sandy does such a beautiful job. Like Caleb and I were both literally almost in tears. Well, I think Caleb actually was. I was on the verge. Like it was so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then Cal introduced us to small game hunting, which is a phenomenal starting point. Uh, our last call, we had Alexis Burnett on and we intentionally moved from small game into big game uh, with the white tailed deer. Um, and then this week we had Daniel on to share about this idea of hunting from start to finish. Like, how do I pick a species? No, I'm doing it sustainably and walk through the process. So for those of you that are interested in carrying on this journey and making it for a, re a reality for you, you know, if you're feeling that part inside of you, that's just like, I'm, everything that's being said tonight makes sense to me on a deep level. Like I have this calling, um, but I don't know how to get started. I don't have a mentor. Then I'd like to invite you to come and join us. Uh, we're going to be basically giving, uh, running this program intensively between now and the end of the, the fall hunt here. Uh, so that goes till about mid-December. But anyone that joins right now, we're actually gonna give you lifetime access to this experience with uh, myself and Caleb and a whole bunch of other guest mentors. Uh, Dr. Kersey Lawrence is gonna be our next call on Monday. And that's just for people that enrolled in the program. Uh, she is a phenomenal wildlife tracker, biologist, uh, spends part of her year over in Africa. Uh, so Kersey is gonna be coming on Monday. And we're basically, our goal of this program is to kind of take you from wherever you are right now um, help you process um, what it's going to take to get you hunting in a way that you can feel the empowerment of bringing home food to your family, know you're doing it in a sustainable way, uh, and walk you through that. So you're going to have lifetime access basically to the community um, where you get support and accountability, um, and you get to come in and share your stories, your questions, or when you have a bad day or ethical, moral questions come up, you can come share that with us and reflect on it and have people that are kind of like your people uh, to share that experience with you. You're also going to get a, a com really comprehensive video library of all kinds of skills and tactics uh, that you can watch at your own pace. And then you're going to get the live calls. So we're going to be doing them uh, very regularly, basically until the end of December. And then they're going to be once a month in the winter. And then we're going to start up with them twice a month again in the spring. So you'll have lifetime access to a hunting mentor community. And it's not just myself and Caleb. It's actually a network of mentors that are going to be inside there supporting you. So uh, we're going to switch over to the, the Q&A in a second here, but I just kind of wanted to throw out that last invite. We're actually closing down registration on Monday, um, just before we go live with Kersey, um, so that we can really focus our efforts on mentoring the students that are in there right now. So this is the 2021 cohort. Uh, if you'd like to enjoy it, I invite you to do that. Uh, and we have a special code right now to get $100 off tonight. Um, if you enter WILD100, then you will get $100 off at www.thehuntersjourney.com. So again, go to thehuntersjourney.com, enter WILD100 uh, for $100 off this evening. Um, and with that said, if you got any questions too, I'm going to throw my email in the chat in a minute there, it's, but I'll say it, it's chris at chrisoutdoors.ca. You also would have got an email from me. So feel free to fire me uh, any questions you have to see whether this is a right fit for you and the next step for you in your community. So... Uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, Caleb, do you want to share anything about that? Or, or should we jump over to some questions with, uh, with Daniel here? I'm trying to get my camera to work. Oh, there we go. This course, uh, I don't want to make, take too much more time to talk about the course because Chris was so eloquent with it and did a really good talk about it. This course means a lot to me. This course has been something that I've been really hungry for for years now to happen in the community. I've taught and mentored 
about 50 people in my lifetime teaching them to hunt. And it's my favorite thing to do is take someone new out on the land. As Chris was talking about with that old timer, he went out goose hunting with just a couple of days ago. It is the most enriching feeling in my life to help pass on this knowledge to everybody. Cause this is, this is knowledge for everybody. This is knowledge that should be in every household, in my opinion. So it's really, really beautiful that we're doing this. So I really heavily encourage everybody here to at least check it out. www.thehuntersjourney.com. Please check this stuff out. And uh, Chris is throwing in there the, again, it's wild 100 for the promo code for tonight's registration and registration closes on Monday. So thank you again, everybody for tuning in for that part. Uh, I'm going to start asking some of the questions that our audience has for you. Uh, hey, can you give us 10 more minutes, Daniel? I know we're a bit over here, oh, but I'd love, I'd love to. I'm having a great time. Awesome. 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 So the first question I have here is from Jessica Baxter. Uh, and the question is for Daniel. Now that you are six years into your hunting, reviewing your learning curve, what would you do differently from your learning approach, if anything? Your Wild Fed podcast is incredible and definitely one of my favorites or one of my elders. Oh, wow. Well. Man, I really have enjoyed the journey. That's a good question, Jessica. Thank you. And guys, I just want to say, I think it's so awesome you're doing this course because when I started six years ago, I had a really hard time. I thought I would just go find courses and I would get taught, you know? Um, I think if there's anything, I would probably just have had it even less judgments about things coming into it. I think that's just one of the, this isn't true for everybody, but I think a lot of people coming to hunting later in life, that's the big thing. It's like a, it's a re, it's, it's seeing modern day hunting as part of the problem and not understanding that your opinions and views might've been shaped by um, a kind of long-term cultural, uh, um, would be the world, a, a word, a, a cultural uh, engineering. There's been like a mental engineering that's, that's driving people away from the natural world. And um, so a lot of judgments that we have, they're not necessarily even our own. So um, I think I would come to it even a little bit more clear, but um, I think outside of myself, uh, there's a couple things I would, I could almost recommend. And one would be, um, don't be afraid to um, bring in things from other worlds. For instance, I would rather probably learn to shoot like in a, in a, I would rather go to like take a proper shooting class from maybe like a tactical school than I would learn from like, want to learn from the people who maybe the, some of my hunting mentors who are great at hunting, but maybe not that good at shooting, you know? So that's for, for me, those kind of things, I would recommend like, don't be afraid to, when I, when I get in my tree stand, I use a harness that comes from my rock climbing days, not those harnesses that come with your tree stand. I don't, I think they're bad. So don't be afraid to draw stuff for a long time. I was afraid to uh, sort of mix and match things. And I'd say, just don't be afraid to pull in all of the skills you have from what you already do. Cause you, you might have more already than you realize. And it took me a little while to kind of come to terms with that, but, but honestly, my, but I, I love the name of this course, the hunter's journey. Cause uh, man, I almost wouldn't trade anything for my journey, Jessica. I feel so good about how I've gotten here. I'm a little embarrassed looking back, like I said, at just some of my cockiness or some of my, some of my um, judgments that I had. Cause over time you find yourself in situations and you're like, oh, that's why people do it this way. I thought they were just being, you know, arrogant or rednecks or something like that. Or I thought that was so wasteful. And now I'm, now it's two in the morning and I'm running out of time and space and coolers and freezers. And, oh, I get why people don't use every scrap. Or I thought I was going to do that hide, you know, and I thought it was wrong not to do it. And I am not going to get to this hide or whatever, it, whatever it is. Um, you might find that some of the things that you have judgments about are, are very practical later on. And you'll understand why other people have these challenges too. So, so the more open your mind can be um, and uh, the less judgments you bring to it, the better. I'm just, I'm just laughing there. Cause I could, I could, I'm not going to, but I could share so many stories of like really <laughs> dumb things I did when I first started out hunting and I'll share actually a really short snippet of one, but I actually haven't, I'm almost, this is one of those, ones I'm totally embarrassed to see this and I won't name who I did this with, but my very first bear hunt, we didn't have a clue what we're doing. Like this was so stupid and ridiculous. And I literally remember we were walking out to bait a bear pile, like in the dark, 
you know, it's like four in the morning and we have this dead raccoon from that we pulled off the road and my buddy's got it on a stick and I'm walking behind him with my little stick bow, you know, like in case like we got charged on the way, like this was, this was 15 years ago. We do not teach this in the course now. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, like I look back on that and I'm like, oh my goodness, some of the ideas I, I came up with, like in my early days and just the dumb things I did. And, and I actually don't regret any of them, you know, that's how I yeah, kind of learned trial cool. by the fire, but that's um, it. how we learned. Yeah, what, what, uh, I think this would be a great kind of closing question here, Daniel, because I don't see a ton coming up. Um, but someone said, hey, could you share a, a hunting story with us that you feel good about? Uh, I would, I think that was from John Ben Sickle. It would be beautiful to hear one of your experiences or a story that stands out to you and just tell us a little bit about that hunt. Well, I'll, I want to talk about, I mean, I'm, I tend to have, I tend to be most excited about what's fresh in my mind. So I want to talk about uh, the buffalo that I just harvested. And um, what was really cool to me was to, I've been trying to work out for myself, how do, uh, you know, and I guess it's interesting, you know, Caleb, I didn't know, um, coming to this, what your backstory was, um, growing up, uh, sort of with so many generations between who I am now and where my people were hunting and gathering on the landscape, having that kind of disconnect coming back, it's been like, how, how do I want to express my gratitude to the animals that I take? You know, I, I don't want to appropriate somebody else's culture. I don't want to, um, you know, but I don't want to feel like I'm just making stuff up either, you know, and I always just, this has been a challenge to me, you know, so I see people have their different ways, you know, and over time I've kind of developed some as well, but, um, being with the Dakota was really cool to see some of what they did, you know, and again, how it wasn't with this, um, Hollywood style, you know, it wasn't the dances with wolves, stoic native with the flute music background thing. It wasn't, you know, all that kind of silly nonsense. It was like really as practical as putting your keys in the ignition and turning them on. It was just like another thing. And so when our bison went down, the first thing that happened was somebody grabbed a bunch of sage off the landscape and stuffed it into his mouth. It was his last meal, you know? And then immediately, uh, my friend Travis starts to sing and, uh, and pray. And then uh, I cut that animal's carotid artery. Uh, the shot I had taken was to um, the atlas vertebra. So um, the animal immediately dropped, but the nervous system uh, was shut down, uh, brain dead, but the heart has its own electrical signal and nothing had ended that. So the heart's still beating, even though the animal's basically flatlined. So I get in and I cut the, the artery and uh, Travis reaches a hand down and it fills with blood and he picks it up and he starts drinking it. And I mean, I just was like, I, I'd never done that. You know, that was like a step further than I'd ever even thought to go and uh, reached my hand there and, and did that with him. And um, this is stuff that I doesn't happen when I'm out with my, some of the mentors that I have here who are kind of that, that type of hunter we've been talking about that more kind of classic, you know, sportsman hunter, you know, and getting to see the uh, kind of reverence that was paid. But again, without kind of, I find that a lot of people from my culture, when they want to be spiritual, they get silly stoic. It gets like the, the, all the airs out of the room. There's no humor left. And I really enjoyed, I remember Travis was singing a Dakota song. He sings, he sings. And then in the middle of the song, he stops and goes, Hey, you got a knife, bro. And then he goes right back to singing. Like it's so seamless. Like, it's not like now we're doing spiritual stuff and now we're doing, you know, practical stuff. It's like, it, this was healing for me. So this last hunt, like I keep saying it was medicine for me because I needed to see people with a legacy, uh, intact tradition. So I get a sense of what I want to bring to it. Cause like I said before, I would feel sometimes I would pick some grass and I'd put it in my deer's mouth, you know, and I'd be like, ah, am I just making this up? Or some people would be like, oh, you got to put tobacco. Or then I have another friend who's like, Hey man, you don't grow tobacco. Why don't you take the wild rice you bring and put that. And I'd be trying these different offerings, doing all these different things. And then it was just like really healing to see people, their legacy. And so this last hunt I was on has changed me as a hunter. Um, it was something about hunting with people, who are connected back 
without, while there's been tremendous cultural wounds that have happened, there's still uh, a connection back to people who lived this way on the landscape. And I think there's just been so much removed. I think a lot of, um, a lot of European descended people come to the hunt um, with a kind of imposter complex. And uh, that got healed for me on this hunt. And it happened the moment that I drank the blood from that animal. Somehow it was like a, it felt like a transmission direct from that animal's heart. I mean, that blood that I drank had just left that animal's heart and immediately entered into me. And uh, I don't know how to say it because I don't have words for it, but uh, it's changed something for me. And so um, I think every hunt, after this uh, will be sort of built upon that foundation. And I realize it's not really about what your tradition is. It's just about um, what's in your heart and, and what's real and authentic rather than um, it masquerading as being something else. It's like, you know, the authenticity is in here. And I, I got that out of this last hunt. That was beautiful. Can I add one more piece to that too? I want to say Please. that that was the first hunt my wife was on. My She'd been on some squirrel oh, wow. hunts and a couple small game hunts with me. Uh, but um, something that's come up a little bit in, in our conversation tonight, and I just kind of want to leave us with this, is like sharing this with the people you love is very powerful. And feeding people is the most wonderful experience. I love to have people over and to cook game for them. I, there's something about eating the animal and the skull is there in the room with me. And it's like that we're eating that animal. It's not that we're eating bear. We're eating that bear. That's really powerful. And getting to give a gift of meat to somebody or getting to have someone over for a meal. I, I, I don't, it, it's the greatest feeling getting to share. So it's not just about, you know, the hunter's journey is like part of it's like your personal journey, but man, part of it's getting to share with other people. And I really get what you were saying about that duck hunter crying, getting to see you guys be successful. Like when you get to take somebody else out, when it comes your turn to mentor, man, it's the best feeling. So like, there's something that you get to share. Uh, this is so fundamentally human. And when you start this, you will find yourself plugging into so many fundamentally human things that it's like, how was I living before? Because this is part of being a human being uh, and always has been, even if there's been some breaks in it, even if culture's kind of looking down on it now, um, this is really fundamentally human. I'd love to just share something on that because you, you know, you bring up this part about sharing and we, we haven't talked about that a lot in this call, and, but how important that is to the culture around it. And uh, I just want to share something really short about my own journey, uh, what was really beautiful for me. So I didn't tell this part of the goose hunt, um, but uh, a few years ago, so one of the people that actually inspired me to get into hunting was my, uh, I guess what you call my father-in-law, my wife's uh, father or, or stepdad. And he was one of the only hunters I really knew in my life. And that was actually when I was a vegetarian, I started seeing his relationship with the land. And, you know, he came across in a bit of a gruff way and you might look at him and think he's a redneck, but I realized pretty quickly, like, no, he has this really deep relationship. And, uh, a few years ago, he passed away. So wild food and my, my wife, um, her family, they're French, uh, French Canadian and Algonquin heritage. So wild food was a big part of their annual traditions, you know, making sapote and tortier with wild meat. And Bob used to bring that home for the family. And with him passing, uh, you know, suddenly there's this like deep purpose. Like I now have a responsibility to carry on this tradition in my wife's family. And the day after the goose, uh, we harvested the goose, my wife, uh, mother, and my mother as well. Now my second mother, she came over for dinner and we cooked the goose that dinner and served it to my mother-in-law or my mother there. And, you know, for me, that's like, sometimes it's really hard to, to find purpose in this modern world and to know like what's right and what's wrong. And, you know, and then even, uh, you know, as, as much as people might look at me and say, Oh man, you look like you got your shit together. You got all this stuff going on. Like, you know, I battle with those, those deep introspective questions. Like we all do, this world can be really hard. And when I'm feeding goose that I harvested to my mother-in-law that my father-in-law isn't bringing home anymore. And I'm feeding that tradition of their people. It's like, no, that's like purpose beyond anything else like there's nothing that makes more sense to me than that 
um, and that's not serving the world in a good way. So uh, I, I just really appreciate that you brought that in there, Daniel. And I think that's a beautiful way to, to close things out. I could keep talking all night, so I'm going to stop. Um, what I will just share is that if anyone, um, oh, thanks, Kersey. Kersey's just sharing. Uh, yeah, bringing her to tears right now. Uh, Kersey's going to be on with on a Monday. Uh, Kersey's an amazing human. She was actually on Daniel's podcast as well, uh, I believe, right? The two of you did an episode, didn't you? Know? We have, no. I don't oh, think no. We Oh, I thought Kersey Lawrence was on your show. I don't know where I got that from. Okay. But I'm, I, this whole time you've been saying that and I'm like, I need to reach out to her. Yeah, there's a you and Kersey <laughs> to Jack, for sure. Hey, Kersey, um, it sounds like you're here. Uh, let's uh, get together on my show. I'd love to have you on. <laughs> Anyways, where, where I was going to leave there is uh, I'm going to stop talking for the night. Uh, Kersey is going to be our uh, guest instructor on Monday night's class. Uh, if you would like to join us on this journey, if you're connecting with the values, if you want to have a community that supports you, then I invite you to come join us in the Hunter's Journey. Registration is closing Monday, so I'm going to throw the link down there one more time. Wild 100 will get you $100 off, and I'll just pass it off to uh, both Caleb and Daniel if either of you want to share kind of a closing thought. And uh, I'm going to try really hard not to say anything else after you two speak and actually I, shut up. I, I need to say gachimi guach to both you. That so miigwech is Anishinaabe Mono Ojibwe language for the closest thing we have to the word thank you. It means like you've given me what I need. Like I've, I've, I've received what I require. Gitchi miigwech is talking about that aspect of, like when you hear like Gitchi Manado or Gitchi Manitou, it's talking about that aspect that is so vast we can't comprehend it. And so like Gitchi miigwech is that concept of you've given me more than I can even express. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to say that to both of you. you. You brought me to tears again. Damn you, Chris. <laughs> um, Growing up, I, I, I suffered from, I still suffer from uh, depression. Um, most, mostly built on anxieties from my own upbringing and problems that I've dealt with that I'm still dealing with and healing through. Um, when I was with an elder once, I told him flat, I was like, I, I don't feel like I have anywhere to be, anywhere to any place in this world. And I feel like it's just time for me to go. And I was talking about that suicidal aspect that a lot of people who go through depression go through. And uh, he said to me, well, you've got a gun at home. And I thought he was going to go in a really dark direction with it. And he said, go hunt. There's a woman down the street whose husband died last year who doesn't have someone to help bring food in. There's two grandparents down the road that don't have anybody to help that take care of them. There's a woman down the road who's an elder who doesn't have children, doesn't have a husband. She never married. They need food. If you don't have a reason to live for yourself, die for your people. Go feed them. And... To this day, I feed my grandmother, I feed my aunts, I feed my cousins, I feed anybody that comes my way that says they need it because of that. And it gives me so much hope and it gives me so much pride and it gives me so much healing and medicine. And to hear two other people talk about that same thing in different aspects from different perspectives of it is just so rewarding and enriching and it's helping justify and, and strengthen my resolve in those ways. So I want to say again, Kachimigwech for that. Thank you so much for that to both of you. Um, Daniel, this has been an absolute pleasure for myself. And I'm, I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Chris, but he can't speak anymore. So I'll speak on his behalf. <laughs> He's very happy about this as well. He's we're both very, very happy to have you with us tonight. This was absolutely rewarding and absolutely exactly what I was hoping it would be. So thank you for that. And to everybody down here who's been with us. Thank you for joining in. Apologies for the tears and the emotional talk. But it's good. It's it's good emotions. It's good, healthy emotions. All emotions are good as long as you work with them and open yourself to them. So thank you, everybody. That's all I want to say. Just I want to leave it with, with gratitude with that way. So thank you to both of you and thank you to everybody tuning in. Um, hopefully we get to see about the rest of you on Monday with Kersey. Uh, I'm excited to see that as well. So I'm going to shout out myself. Uh, Daniel, if you feel like you have any last words you want to say and then we can end the evening to let you get off with your day and spend the evening with your lovely wife and our squirrel dinner uh caleb thank you for sharing that man i'm really moved by what you just said um getting to share that's the thing you know um i, I just want to the last thing i want to say tonight is uh somebody had asked earlier about the future of hunting you know what's it look like i'm so moved to get to be part of this changing of the guard the, there's um it's just a natural cycle of things. There's a whole way of that hunting has been viewed since the conservation revolution that took place when the market hunt ended and the sport hunt took its place. 
now the sport hunts ending and a new type of subsistence hobby hunting is happening. Uh, we all can go to the store, but we choose to hunt for our food. And um, this is something new. And all of you who have been here with us tonight are part of that. And I'm excited to see what the stereotypical hunter looks like in 10 years because it doesn't look like the one we've been seeing. It's a whole, you know, I've been saying to my my friends recently, like, it's going to be interesting when all the tattoo face kids are starting to hunt, you know? And like, I don't want to be the one being like, what's up with all these kids today and their, their damn face tattoos? It's like, because I've come in with long hair and tattoos and the hunters were like, I don't know about this guy. So it's cool to see that it's changing and we're part of that. And I'm excited to be part of that with you guys. And uh, um, I think it's so beautiful what you're offering people with this course. And I think you nailed it. It really is a journey. So well done. And uh, thanks for having me tonight. All right. Well, we'll leave it there, everybody. Um... The one thing I will share is uh, that we do have a free hunters community as well. Uh, I'll send out the link in a follow-up one there. Um, Caleb and I are going to be focusing most on the hunters journey course the next little bit, uh, but feel free to get in there and, you know, connect with other people, ask your questions. We are going to put some free stuff in from there from time to time as well. Um, we'll stay in touch by email. If you got any questions, fire me an email. Um, yeah. Thanks so much everybody for a wonderful night uh, and for being so engaging. The comments, uh, all the gratitude is really touching. So uh, good night, everybody. Take care. Um, and I will ask that people roll out um, uh, relatively quickly because Caleb and I are going to stick around for a second and, and just uh, connect here. So.